Visa versus MasterCard, which is the better investment? In the second round of the Battle of the Investments, we are going to do an analysis of two information technology service providers. You could invest money in both, but every dollar you invest in one is a dollar you could have invested in the other and didn't. You want to maximize your investments, and I am here to provide information and education which can help you make the decisions to do so. In this video, you will learn and understand these companies' business model and compare their services, opportunities, growth, valuation, profitability, and dividends. This video will also teach you how to evaluate stocks. Please like and subscribe so you never miss a future investing video. The first thing you need to do when analyzing a company is take a moment to understand what the company is and what it does. Many people skip this step and their ability to make wise investment decisions suffer. I'll give you an overview, but I encourage you to do your own research as well. Visa and MasterCard provide an array of services, but their major role is to provide the technology and network that allows digital transactions to take place. Take a look at your debit or credit card. It will likely say Visa or MasterCard, but it also has another entity listed. This could be a bank, credit union, retailer, government agency, or some other group. For this credit card, Capital One is listed. This is called the issuer. The issuer is the one that is providing you the credit line or allowing you access to funds through a debit card. An acquirer is a financial institution that accepts and processes transactions made with the card. This is typically a bank like JP Morgan, Bank of America, or Chase. Does that sound confusing? Let me explain. Take a look here to see how it all works. You, the cardholder, have this Capital One credit card. You go to the store and attempt to make a $100 purchase with your card. In a fraction of a second, the store submits the data for your purchase to Chase Bank, which has a contract with the store. Chase charges them a $0.19 cent acquiring fee. Chase then sends the information through Visa, which takes $0.13 cents, to Capital One. Capital One charges their own $2.20 fee and then approves the transaction and transfers the money through Visa back to Chase, who sends the remaining $97.25 to the store. The store gives you your purchase and you go on your way. Meanwhile, Capital One adds the purchase to your bill. You must then later pay Capital One back for your $100 purchase or you will be charged interest. Or given the option to hit the like button, so please take a moment to do so. This means Visa and MasterCard are working as an intermediary between these companies and banks, providing the technology services needed to make that purchase in a tiny fraction of a second. The benefit for MasterCard and Visa is when there are problems in the economy and people can't repay their debts, MasterCard and Visa are less impacted. The cardholder doesn't owe them any money. The money was owed to the issuer. This gives them a greater degree of protection when compared to American Express and Discover because they are also issuers. There is much more to Visa and MasterCard than this illustration demonstrates. This graphic illustrates a more comprehensive look at Visa. First, they also allow for many of the secure payments you are sending online using CyberSource. They offer their clients consultation and analytics services using their extensive data network. On the top right, you see they also offer fraud management and security services. In fact, they help prevent $25 billion in fraud using artificial intelligence. You can see in the yellow ring they are working in many different directions. G2C means that they are now working to facilitate transactions between governments and consumers, for example when they process cards used for welfare. B2B is the business-to-business -business transactions which take place. B2C are the transactions between businesses and their clients. In fact, Visa shows clients will be able to reach over 99% of bank accounts in 88 countries using their services. P2P here means peer-to-peer. -peer. If you want to transfer money to another individual, you are likely using a number of different platforms to send money electronically to others. Seven of the biggest peer-to-peer -peer platforms in the U.S. are powered through Visa. These include ACI, Bancorp, and WorldPay. Visa has partnerships, e-commerce, and tap-to-pay. Looking at their core products, Visa has issued over $3.4 billion at over 61 million merchant locations. They also have ventures with fintech companies, such as those shown on the screen. Some, like Stripe, are already bringing in over a $1 billion in revenue per year based on a massive volume of transactions. Visa has a diversified stream of revenue. Take a look here. They receive nearly $10 billion in service revenue, over $10 billion in data processing revenue, almost $8 billion in international transaction revenues, and $1.3 billion in other revenues for a grand total of $29.2 billion. You can also see impressive growth in income and revenues in this graphic, but take a look at the bottom. Visa processed $8.8 .8 trillion in a single year during 138.3 billion transactions. They also paid out almost $11 billion in dividends and share buybacks. MasterCard has a very similar structure, providing the technology for transactions, automation, security, and data, working with fintech companies as their expert partners, and providing similar solutions for businesses, governments, and consumers, much like Visa. 
You can pause the video to read these if you like, but MasterCard offers a range of services which are intended to enhance the efficiency, optimization, and security of the transactions and their clients. Security can be broken down into three categories, Master ID Theft Protection, Authentication Services, and Cybersecurity. Not only that, Visa and MasterCard have access to big data, and data is everything these days. MasterCard has been utilizing its data, consulting services, and software to offer their clients data on their own customers. As an example, MasterCard has a service they have created for restaurants designed to help them improve operations, win new guests, and grow guest loyalty, frequency, and spending. There are options to test a program's impact, analyze a restaurant menu to improve the menu, pricing and marketing, better understand the macroeconomics of the industry based on real-time retail spending data, and utilize rewards, services, and offer programs. Let's compare the returns of both companies in fast graphs. MasterCard's annualized returns without the dividend was an incredible 34.1%, and the average dividend growth rate was almost 51%. $10,000 in 2006 would now be worth over $612,000. That crushes the S&P 500, which would have only given you $26,000 for the same time period. If you were wishing you had bought $10,000 of MasterCard in 2006, I do too. Now you might be thinking you are a small investor and $10,000 is a lot to invest. Another way to consider this is to think that if you had only invested $1,000 in 2006, it would now be worth over $61,000. That's an amazing return. Visa would have also given a 51% average dividend growth rate. However, the return without dividends was only 22%. Your $10,000 would now be worth about $116,000. Although dwarfed by MasterCard, this is about triple the S&P 500 and very impressive. Also, please note that the dividend payout ratio for both companies has consistently been very low. This gives great dividend safety. There is very little danger of the dividend being cut. This is partly because the dividend yield is very low, with MasterCard yielding only 0.6% and Visa only yielding a 0.68%. What can we expect for future growth? Let's look again at fast graphs. We are looking at MasterCard. Analysts have forecasted a 15% drop in earnings for 2020, but an increase of 34% in 2021 and an increase of 21% in 2022. Visa is more muted. If you look here, you will see it is expected to only drop by 8% in 2020, but then will increase by 19 and then 18% in the following years. Let's take a look at what Fidelity tells us about past and future growth. The percentiles on the right are only for MasterCard. I have Visa next to MasterCard here for comparison. Over the past 12 months, MasterCard's earnings per share grew more than twice as fast as Visa's, but both were well above average. Over the last five years, MasterCard's average growth was slightly higher than Visa's and did very well compared to the industry, placing MasterCard at the 85th percentile. Next year, they are projecting a 30% increase in earnings per share for MasterCard compared to a little under 19% for Visa. Over the next three to five years, they expect slightly higher earnings growth for MasterCard. Revenue is similar, with MasterCard performing slightly better last year and Visa performing slightly better over the last five years. Cash flow is slightly higher for MasterCard with a very healthy 17% growth rate over the last five years. This has allowed them their amazing dividend growth. As a final projection for you, CNN Business shows a forecast range for where each stock might be over the next 12 months. Approximately a 15.5% increase in share price for MasterCard and a 13.8% increase for Visa are forecasted. Let's focus on valuation. We are looking again at Fidelity and once more these percentiles are only for MasterCard. The price-to-earnings ratio for both companies is very high, with MasterCard higher at over a 34 and at the 69th percentile for the industry. I would like to see this at least closer to a 25 to a 27 before I bought in. The price-to-earnings to growth ratio for both is a 2.4. We ideally want this at a 1 or even below. Price-to-cash flow is sky high with MasterCard at a 32 and Visa at a 29. MasterCard is at the 92nd percentile. This is simply too high for me. Price to sales for both is around a 16 and close to the highest for the industry. Price to book for MasterCard is outrageously high. In conclusion, both are far too overvalued for an investment, MasterCard even more so than Visa. I will illustrate this further through fast graphs. The dark green is earnings. We would expect the black line, which is the price to earnings, to follow the dark green earnings line. That is actually what happened from 2005 up until around mid-2012. At that point, the price began to take off and became progressively overvalued. The current blended P.E. here is a 36.41, but the P.E. for MasterCard has typically been around a 27 over the past 20 years. If the price for MasterCard dropped back down to its normal P.E. over the next few years, 
we would only see a 3.4% annual return. You might argue that investors have been valuing MasterCard since 2012 more highly, and we should therefore be applying a higher multiple. Since 2012, the normal PE has been at 29.62. If it returns to that, it will only return 6.8% annually. At some point, share price must be tied to earnings and profitability. Earnings for MasterCard have grown fast, over 23% annually since 2006. However, the share price has been growing far faster, especially in the past 8 years. At some point, the share price must fall in line with earnings, and I'm expecting a slower rate of return for the future unless we can buy on a dip. Please note the market cap is a huge $270 billion, as an S&P credit rating of A+, and a 69% long-term debt-to-capital ratio. It's more debt than I would like to see, but the size of the company and credit rating gives us some added confidence. Let's do the same for Visa. Visa has a nearly identical trajectory. Up until around 2012, the price reasonably followed the earnings in dark green. Around 2012, the share price lost its sense of gravity and floated away. Although earnings have rapidly increased at 20% annually on average, share price has increased even faster. Given its significant overvaluation, if it returns from its 33.82 blended PE to its historically normal PE of 25.56, we are only going to see an average annual return of 1.7% until the fall of 2022. If we accept a higher PE based on share price since 2012, the normal PE would be at 27.71. If it returns to this share price, we are only looking at a 5.1% annual return. Visa is AA- rated and has a lower 26% long-term debt-to-capital ratio. It is much larger than MasterCard with a market cap of over $377 billion. So in conclusion, both companies are overvalued. MasterCard's valuation is even more extreme, but its future growth prospects appear greater, which explains this higher premium placed on MasterCard. We are now looking at debt. If you look at the Visa and MasterCard columns, you can see MasterCard has far more debt than Visa, comparatively. For long-term debt to equity over the past 12 months, MasterCard's 178% is over triple Visa's 52%. On the far right, we can compare their debt to the industry. The first column shows Visa's percentile, and the second is MasterCard's. Visa's debt is in line with the industry, falling at the 51st percentile. Their debt to capital for the last year is at the 41st percentile, and total debt to equity is at the 51st percentile. This seems reasonable. MasterCard for those same areas is at the 79th, 76th, and 77th percentile. This is a negative for MasterCard, and Visa wins on this one. That being said, both are easily able to cover their debt. Both have massive amounts of free cash flow, and MasterCard's interest coverage for their debt is 33.2 times. We want to see at least 2, so 33.2 is well above what we need to feel safe. Visa's coverage is currently 27.2. As a quick look into margins and returns, Visa and MasterCard both excel with fantastic numbers. You won't see numbers like this for any company in any sector very often. The margins for both companies are primarily between the 98th and 100th percentile. Returns are also primarily between the 98th and 100th percentile, although some trail down to the 86th percentile. When you look at the numbers next to one another for the past year, Visa's margins are consistently higher than MasterCard's. Given it is a larger company and has more resources, it is not too surprising that they have been more efficient. So in that regard, Visa is the winner. However, when looking at returns, MasterCard is the winner, significantly outpacing Visa. Let's take a look at future directions. Visa has been expanding rapidly through fintech ventures. For example, Fold will launch the co-branded Visa card after getting picked to join Visa's fintech fast track program. Rather than airline miles or loyalty points, shoppers will earn Bitcoin back on purchases made with the card. Users can spend from their Bitcoin rewards by purchasing currency-based gift cards for retailers at the Fold app, or they can allow the value to accumulate like they would in a savings account. Visa recently purchased Plaid for $5.3 billion. Plaid lets its users share financial information and connect their bank accounts with apps and services such as Acorns, Betterment, Chime, TransferWise, and Venmo. Both companies are looking to expand their services to more customers and improve the efficiency and convenience of their services to businesses and consumers. MasterCard has won contracts in France and Canada with their anti-money laundering solutions and have 10 more markets in the pipeline. MasterCard is also working to distribute the social benefits to Mexican citizens on behalf of the Mexican government, distributing around 20 million new debit cards for them to receive social benefit payments. They are also expanding in India and Africa. They have a mobile platform for use by small farmers in East Africa and seek to continue to expand their test and learn technology I mentioned earlier. MasterCard sees huge opportunities which they and Visa will attempt to capitalize on. 
Both are working to expand real-time payments and see many factors driving this expansion, including need for efficiency, response to technological changes, and a need to reduce risk. Faster payments like these real-time payments are expected to continue to grow extremely fast and will likely be lucrative for both companies. In this chart, there is an expected compound annual growth rate of 95%. That is huge. Non-cash payments are continuing to grow overall, about 6.5% globally. Central Europe, Middle East, and Africa, or CEMEA, and Latin America are expected to grow the fastest with annual growth rates of 10-12%. to Again, the future is very bright for the companies that capitalize on this growth. People are not just switching from cash to card, but also check to card. From 2017 to 2021, there is a predicted 19.2% compound annual growth rate. Again, huge opportunities for Visa and MasterCard means huge opportunities for us as shareholders. As it stands, Visa processes $14.60 of every $100 spent by U.S. consumers. MasterCard processes $8.28 out of every $100. I expect to see this increase considerably over time. In conclusion, I believe MasterCard is a smaller but faster growing company, offering more opportunities for shareholders in the future. Currently, both companies are overvalued and I can't invest my money at this time. I intend to wait for the right valuation before investing. You can't go wrong with an investment in either company, but based on the available information, I see MasterCard as the currently superior investment. Which do you think is the better investment, Visa or MasterCard? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. I look forward to hearing from you and learning from you. Don't forget to subscribe because I'll be creating new videos for you every week. As always, good luck with your investing.